You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian Geopolitics. As always, I'm your host in New York City, Ankit Panda. And I'm actually not joined today by my usual co-host, Prashant Parmesran, but I'm joined by a guest. Um, Peter Bittner joins me today. Peter was an editorial assistant with The Diplomat this summer, and he was actually in Mongolia doing a lot of great reporting for us that you can read on the website. Uh, in particular, I direct you to his uh, photography and a magazine feature that he did for us on pollution in the Mongolian city of Ulaanbaatar. Now, Mongolia is a fascinating country. It occupies a neighborhood that's quite um, sparse in terms of the number of countries. There's really five countries in Northeast Asia, but um, they're all huge. I mean, you have China, the world's second largest economy, the first in Asia, Japan, the third largest economy in the world, the second in Asia, South Korea, an economic power in its own right, and North Korea, the hermit kingdom, continuously pulling headlines for its various nuclear t- tests and uh, other provocations. And here you have Mongolia, once a global empire uh, eight centuries ago in the 13th century under Genghis Khan. But now the country really gets left off the headlines. Uh, So I'm really glad to have someone like Peter who's uh, been there recently and done some uh, some reporting. All right. So, um, Peter, thanks a lot for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Really looking forward to having you on the episode since Mongolia has been a long-term interest of mine. And I actually wanted to begin by asking you about your interest in the country and how you became drawn to Mongolia. Great question. So I visited as a student about six years ago for a month studying Tibetan Buddhism, and I've been back since three more times, and I lived there for a year as a Fulbright English teaching assistant um, where I lived in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. That's great. Um, So one of the big developments we saw this summer was uh, obviously the elections and the you know, the topsy-turviness of parliament with the Mongolian People's Party coming back. Can you tell us a bit about the significance of uh, the politics that we witnessed in Mongolia this summer? Right. Well, yeah, it was certainly an interesting election with that landslide victory by the Mongolian People's Party. It was definitely not entirely anticipated or, you know, settled beforehand. It was a very raucous election season. Uh, There's a 17-day official campaign period that Uh, you know, is really just a a full-out blitz, and it stops the day before the election, and all of the signs are removed, and all of the, you know, street processions, and loudspeakers, and and vans with uh, the politicians, you know, popping out the sunroof really stop, and uh, it, when the dust settled, was was a surprise, I think, to most, that there was a massive 85 percent supermajority in the you know, great hurrah. It's just uh, astounding. Yeah, so the results of that election were quite remarkable. Can you tell us a bit about, you know, what Mongolian voters were essentially, you know, what drove this massive electoral change? Um, I mean, obviously, there's been a few economic difficulties in the country, and the people have been a bit dissatisfied with the status quo. Can you go a bit into that? Absolutely, yes. I mean, so if we go back to 2011, Mongolia was one of the world's fastest growing economies. You know, its GDP growth was uh, over 17 percent, which was absolutely phenomenal. And it's really since uh, been hitting huge slump for a few different reasons. Global commodity prices have really fallen dramatically, but also there's been some missteps on the part of the Mongolian government in dealing with foreign direct investment. So it's uh, yeah, a complicated matter, but I think the voters were really saying in this election, you know, we're ready for a dramatic change. We are not happy with the current economy or, or the leadership in power. Right, right. Um, so overall, um, you know, the presidency, obviously, you know, has um, retained intact. I'm wondering, you know, where you see Mongolia going in the short term. What are the priorities right now in parliament? What essentially is the country most concerned about? Boy, well, with the ongoing debt crisis at hand, it's certainly still about fiscal responsibility and just trying to figure out how to pay back some of its massive uh, debts to both kind of external investors and uh governments it's it's been a great challenge i think so far for the incoming government to take on and uh it's certainly going to be a defining characteristic of the next couple of years uh you know this coming election cycle with uh presidential you know election impending will be very interesting because a lot of uh, democratic party 
has really been overturned, you know, from uh, the very high levels. So it, it'll be interesting to see what happens exactly and if the MPP can really uh, get its act together and, uh, and really live up to a lot of its promises on the campaign trail. Right, right. Um, so let's uh, pivot a bit and talk a bit about foreign policy, uh, since, you know, this is a podcast on geopolitics. And like I said you at bet. the beginning, Mongolia uh, really occupies an interesting region. And it's been interesting to see what the country has been able to do with its position, essentially, as Northeast Asia's smallest and uh, quietest state in some cases. Um, obviously not the smallest in terms of uh, land mass. Uh, Mongolia, I hear, has one of the, I think, lowest population densities in the world, maybe the lowest. That's right. Yeah, it's definitely in the top three. It's uh, quite dramatic. You know, uh, the funny thing is it's about 72 percent urbanized. And so while there is this amazingly low population density on a, a national level, there's, you know, this massive rural urban migration, which continues. Right. And uh, I should point out here to listeners that Peter actually did a great piece for um, one of our magazine issues earlier this summer on pollution in Ulaanbaatar, which I actually learned a lot from because I never actually imagined Ulaanbaatar as having this massive, massive pollution problem. Uh, so that was really interesting. Sure. Can you tell me a bit about yeah. actually, you know, the process of reporting that story? I mean, were you, um, you know, were you surprised to learn anything when you were um, researching and reporting that? That's a great question. So I'd actually lived uh, in Mongolia through the winter several years ago as part of my Fulbright year. And so I knew that it was an issue that needed to get more attention. And I really... Uh, had a personal stake in it. I, I lived at the border of the Gare districts, as they're called, these squatter areas, uh, which kind of comprise over half of the city itself. You know, the yurts, which kind of sprawl throughout the hillsides. It's uh, it's really an astounding kind of uh, urban development challenge, and it results in this coal smoke, which fills the entire valley in the winter time when temperatures drop to below 35 Celsius, uh, negative 35, I should say. It's, wow. um, yeah, quite a challenge just um, from, you know, a physics level and from a yeah, energy level. It's uh, going to take a lot of policy uh, steps from many different actors cooperating to really lead to any f fundamental change because there's been a, a lot of a lot of steps to try to reduce emissions of these Soviet era stoves that are burning coal primarily. Um, but on a you know large scale level, even if you decrease the emissions on a per stove basis, when 40 to 50,000 new inhabitants are coming to the city each year, it's still just a, you know, a numbers game in the end. And uh, I, I learned an awful lot from experts who were researching the public health impacts and uh, you know, a lot of policymakers who are really involved in trying to tackle this challenge, which is really, you know, it, it's leading to massive effects in terms of public health. One in 10 deaths by one study have been attributed to air pollution related causes among residents in, in Ulaanbaatar. Wow, that's stark. Um, but a lot of what it you're is. describing sounds like a very familiar story with, um, mm -hmm. you know, China's that's experiences right. to the south of the border. Um, sure. So definitely Mongolia is not alone on that front um, in not East Asia. Not by any means. Um, right. All right. right. So I, I did get distracted. I did want to talk about foreign policy. Um, of course. So, of course. you know, so when I started at The Diplomat, I turned my attention to Mongolia almost immediately because um, Elbegdor, uh, Egberdor, am I pronouncing that right? I think I am. Um, Dorch, yeah, yeah. Egbert Dorch. Okay, so he um, made a trip to North Korea, which I thought was very interesting. He didn't meet with Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un still hasn't met with any foreign leader. But I looked into, right. you know, I started looking into Mongolia with more interest at the time, and I found out that, you know, I mean, Egbert Dorch was one of the best traveled world leaders um, that year. Uh, and that's really, you know, sure. on, a, on a global scale. I mean, I really, right. you know, it really struck me how much North um, Mongolia was taking its third neighbor policy seriously. And for our listeners, the third neighbor policy um, for Mongolia describes essentially its attempts to forge closer relations with countries that aren't Russia or China, which are its first and second neighbors. Um, and really, it's been remarkable to see Mongolia um, pursue this internationalism with a great deal of energy. What strikes you about um, you know Mongolia's approach to relationships with countries that aren't its immediate neighbors, Peter? Well, I think, you know, it's in a unique geopolitical position, like you said, uh, nestled between two superpowers, essentially, on the global scale. And, uh, you know, they really have emphasized this policy of trying to balance out, uh, you know, their, I guess, relative interests across a geopolitical scale. And they seem to be doing it quite well. You know, it's, it's 
uh, certainly a challenge. I think uh, they have very genuine interest in connecting Asia and Europe in particular. And this last summer with the Asia-Europe meeting, uh, which was quite the spectacle, you know, 50 plus heads of state from both continents all converging on the same weekend. It was uh, a grand show. And it's really something that, you know, Mongolia is, is looking to its history as a real uniter of Asia and Europe, if you go back to the age of Chinggis Khan. It's uh, not something completely new or original. It's something that they're trying to kind of reimagine in their future by, by seeking some examples from their past. And they see themselves as an arbiter of, of dialogue. And, uh, you know, they've shown that through some of the Ulaanbaatar dialogues as well, which, uh, you know, have dealt with really tricky topics like the Korean Peninsula with right. uh, I would say, with finesse. Yeah, I guess uh, eight centuries later, Mongolia is trying to unite the world, not under the sword, but <laughs> under the pen, uh, essentially. Um, that's right. But, but that's very interesting. Um, you know, I was um, I was reading your reporting on the, um, uh, on the Asia-Europe summit this summer, and I guess it was a little bit, um, I mean, obviously, you know, there were tragedies that weekend. We had the coup in Turkey. Right. We had the attacks in Nice. Um, so really, Mongolia's big moment under the sun, its uh, major international coming out, was uh, a little bit overshadowed in the international news. Um, but, you know, to that end, um, you know, I wrote last November uh, in the Diplomats magazine about uh, Mongolia's permanent neut neutrality declaration, which was interesting. It was uh, at the 70th General Assembly, um, Egbert speech, um, you know, his uh, speech before the General Assembly really focused on this idea of Mongolia um, standing up as his example of permanent neutrality in Northeast Asia. And he very specifically, you know, uh, alluded to this idea that you brought up of being this impartial arbiter. Um, and obviously, you know, we have Mongolia that has good relations with um, um, obviously, it's two major neighbors, but most Asia Pacific countries and is one of the few countries that has uh, actually shown a working relationship with uh, North Korea. And, you know, some scholars uh, that work very closely right. on North Korea um, on Mongolia have cited it as a potential example for North Korea, if it ever did want to economically liberalize, you know, we have a very similar, well, not similar because North Korea is really sui generis when it comes to its political system. But Mongolia mm -hmm. and North Korea have very familiar um, endowments, particularly minerals and um, riches that way. And Mongolia really figured out, you know, how to create, as you said earlier, spectacular economic growth out of that. All right. Uh, so I want to continue our discussion of Mongolia's foreign policy. Um, specifically, so we've talked a bit about the Asia-Europe meeting, but can you maybe, you know, go into this idea of Mongolia acting as a neutral in intermediary? Where exactly do we see Mongolia establishing its credentials in this regard? That's a great question. So the Ulaanbaatar dialogue this summer, uh, it actually took place a little bit before the Asia-Europe meeting, I think is a good example of Mongolia really uh, tackling some pretty sticky international issues. You know, this one in particular covered uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, involved North Korea. They're really not afraid to take on uh, you know, some sort of uh, stigmatized or taboo topics uh, within the international community. And I think they definitely have a lot of credentials when it comes to this. If you look back in history at examples, Mongolia was really an arbiter, you know, with the Silk Road going right through it um, and having really linked forcibly Asia and Europe in uh, the era of Chinggis Khan and, and the dynasties that followed, of course. Uh, it's looking to the past to reimagine its future, and I think it's doing a pretty good job at, at uh, credibly putting forward a number of very high-profile events within the last uh, year or two that show that it really wants to be uh, a place where these massive dialogues and forums can take place. Right. Um, that's a good way that you put it, looking to the past to visualize the future. And specifically, you know, you go eight centuries back to the uh, days of Genghis Khan, and you, you, know, you recall Mongolia being this uh, purveyor of hard power. And I wanted to ask you about hard power for Mongolia. You know, I've noticed that it engages in military exercises, uh, not only with its neighbors, but also with, uh, you know, the United States, uh, where it actually has one of the military exercises that has the best name in my regard, Conquest. Um, That's right. It's always good to see a military with a sense of humor and an aptitude for puns. Um, but, you know, no I want, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, so where does Mongolia see itself um, going with its hard power these days? Well, 
it's been really committed to UN peacekeeping operations, and it's shown the international community that it's very serious about sending very well-prepared and well-disciplined troops to conflict zones across the world. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of foreign militaries working with the Mongolian military have been extremely impressed, and they seem to be really uh, sending a, you know, implicit soft power type signal through their participation in these, uh, you know, international exercises and operations that, you know, you don't want to mess with us. We're here. We're, you know, on the front. We're not afraid to go in and take action. And we can play nice with you guys as well. You know, we're, we're able to, through these multilateral, multilateral operations, uh, collaborate in ways that, uh, really exceed you know our population the size of our military tactically i think they show that uh, they are quite sophisticated right so let's take a step back and uh you know there is this intersection of the domestic political debate and foreign policy and geopolitics in nearly every country and that's true of mongolia as well uh when i was you know looking more closely into mongolia's foreign policy last year you know i got I caught whiff of, you know, pretty much two primary debates and maybe a third smaller one, but uh, very much less so. So the first is obviously, you know, the president's vision of this internationalized and neutral Mongolia pursuing the third neighbor policy energetically and really raising the country's profile on the world stage. Uh, the others, however, uh, particularly within the country's parliament, uh, some lawmakers, uh, you know, heavily favor a, a straightforward tilt towards Russia. And, you know, there is this nostalgia for the Soviet days and uh, that aspect of the relationship is there as well. And finally, uh, there is, you know, the second of the two neighbors, uh, China, but that's uh, considerably more muted in the country. So uh, can you talk a bit about that and the sense you got of that debate when you were in Mongolia this summer? Right. It's certainly a lively debate. I think that, you know, there's this Soviet history that can't be discounted. And a lot of older Mongolians who lived during that era, you know, preceding the early 1990s and have memories of that time that is quite nostalgic and romanticized in in many Mongolians' views, uh, particularly because I think, uh, you know, there was a stronger social safety net and distribution of wealth. In the countryside, actually, there were uh, communally managed flocks uh, called negdels, which uh, really created a buffer between, um, you know, storms and decimating livelihoods. And that's something that there has not been in, you know, the intervening uh, democratic, open global market economy era. So there's certainly a lot of complex factors that uh, contribute to Mongolia's relationship with uh, Russia, modern day Russia. And uh, I think, you know, they do have quite cozy relations for other reasons too. Economically, uh, I think Mongolia's oil imports are 90% from Russia. So they're extremely reliant for certain goods and commodities in particular from Russia. Um, whereas China, on the other hand, you know, the other superpower they're stuck between is um, you know, this massive global economy. You know, we're all familiar with its rise and success story in, in the last several decades economically, uh, but militarily as well. There's just a supreme superpower on their doorstep there. Um, And I think there's this anxiety and insecurity that Mongolians feel, especially when it comes to the Chinese. You know, this goes back millennia again, and it's a very nuanced history, back and forth, uh, military conquests and regimes. And um, it's a very well known, actually, that in Mongolia, one of the worst insults to call someone, so I've heard, um, you know, as an outsider, is uh, half Chinese. And so there's wow. this large bias, and there's been documented hate crimes against Chinese workers in Mongolia, and uh, yeah, a, a lot of discrimination. So uh, there's that social context, you know, which has a, a many, many layers to it, um, that's pretty well known. But there's uh, a, a lot more nuance to it. But, yeah, overall, to, to address your original question in terms of the direction for the future, I think there's really only more third neighbor policy uh, down the road. I, I really don't see a way for Mongolia to um, ally with either 
Russia or China in a way that uh, really, you know, leaves out or neglects or somehow overshadows the other. And, and they need, uh, you know, a lever with these international uh, interests, you know, the U.S. included, to act as uh, a way to create space. Right. So, Peter, before we wrap up this conversation about this fascinating country, I do want to ask you, uh, do you see yourself going back to Mongolia anytime soon or would you like to? Absolutely. Yeah, Mongolia is very near and dear to me. I, I certainly uh, hope to get back there this winter to do additional reporting on an air quality story I'm working on now. I'd like to be able to interview and do some multimedia work uh, with people living in these squatter settlements in the Gare districts uh, who are suffering the brunt of this public health crisis I alluded to earlier related to the pollution. All right. Well, Peter, thanks a lot for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's an honor to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. And that wraps up episode 95 of the podcast. We're coming up on episode 100. Uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss out on future episodes here at the Diplomats Podcast. And also do leave us a rating and a review that really helps the podcast increase in visibility out there. And as always, if you're interested in hearing something on the podcast that you haven't heard yet or interested in me addressing something that you've heard before but would like to hear treated in more detail, definitely send me an email or reach out on social media and I'd be happy to add that to the agenda going forward. Thanks as usual for listening.